excellent and admirable patrons, it is time once again to journey down the hobbit hole. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole full of the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, sandy hole. No, this is the hobbit hole, and that means tangents. If you're listening to this, presumably you're familiar with a series of videos I've been doing on my YouTube channel for a while where I examine the different forms magic takes in Middle-earth and try to reverse engineer a logical system of principles that could underlie such occurrences. And in that series, I try to be fairly explicit with the fact that I'm consciously choosing to take an in-universe approach, that I'm probably, quote, reading too much into it, or mining for meanings that Tolkien may not have intended, certainly probably didn't consciously intend, but I do it anyway because A, it's fun, B, it's been a way for me to hunt down parallels and connections between otherwise what would seem like totally disparate parts of the Legendarium, and finally, because this is one avenue into the internal consistency and consonance that Tolkien was so concerned with, something he believed was very important to the aesthetic effect he was trying to achieve, and something that I think a lot of readers, whether they notice it or not, are conscious of as sort of a latent presence behind the Lord of the Rings novels, this sense that not only did Tolkien do the work to come up with a history and an explanation underlying the events that he narrates in greater detail, but also that that history makes sense. It's an integral part of the fictional world he's creating and not just sort of tacked on as an afterthought or as a flourish. It all hangs together. There's a certain rationale behind it, even if it's not one that's directly articulated. So my attempts then to examine magic in Middle-earth through this particular lens arguably are self-indulgent and frivolous and exercises in gratifying and intellectual vanity, but they do occasionally result in insights of merit. Of course, they also occasionally result in wildly speculative but oddly compelling headcanons, if you will, and uh, today I am most definitely dealing with one of those instances. The best way I can describe it is this is me getting comfy in the sandbox that Tolkien has created and sifting my grubby little hands around until I find some cat turds to fling. So you all can consider yourselves warned. That being said, it was too fun not to dig into, given the Feanorian moment that seems to have been happening on the channel in the past couple of weeks, it seemed like there would never really be a better time to introduce this. And even though I would probably never advance this argument as a serious academic one, it does tie in really neatly at the end to some legitimate thematic issues. So this is something that came up for me while I was doing rather intense research and close reads in preparation for the video I did on Oaths and Curses, which was a tie-in to a video I had done earlier on uses of speech as magical within the context of Middle-earth. And furthermore, which led me to separately examine the so-called Curse of the Children of Hurin. The speech video isn't back up yet, but the Turin video and the Oaths and Curses video both are, so the ideas presented there kind of serve as the context and backdrop for this theory that I am about to promulgate, which hinges on the exact functioning of the Oath of Feanor and the supposition that in the final debate between Mithros and Maglor on what they should do after the two remaining Silmarils have been recovered from Morgoth by the host of the Valar and are being held basically under Anway's keeping. The brothers assert their claim, Anway denies that claim, and they have one final debate over just what it is that they should do. And as I carefully read and reread this scene, in light of what I had deduced about the function of speech and of vows and oath-taking and cursing and doom and prophecy within the context of Middle-earth, I couldn't help but be increasingly convinced that from a purely logical and pragmatic perspective, Mithros's position in this final debate is actually the correct one. And when I hinted at this position, it seemed to cause a degree of consternation, of resistance, not entirely unexpected, because of course within the narrative, I think we are meant to 
side with Maglor on this. And hopefully I'll have time to get into at the end how I think morally um, and ultimately Maglor maybe does have the right of it. But in terms of understanding how this curse is potentially going to work, I think Mithras has the edge. So let me kind of examine that claim and uh, see if I can detail my chain of reasoning that led me to this supposition. First of all, because this is Tolkien, we should acknowledge that there's a textual history here. We can trace a couple of different versions of how the account of the Feanorians and their deadly oath comes to an end. In the end, it always comes down to Maglor and Mitros, the last remaining siblings, and frequently the position of the two brothers changes, so we'll kind of get alternating drafts in which now Maglor's the nice one, now Mitros is the nice one again, now it's Maglor who's the nice one, and going along with that, sometimes Maglor is the one who's urging that they submit and give up and try to reconcile. Sometimes it's Mithros. And sometimes they do, in fact, at least make an effort to make the opposite decision to the one they make in the published Silmarillion. And typically that doesn't end much better than what comes to be the more consistent final account. But it is worth noting that there are other ways that Tolkien envisioned this arc ending. But what doesn't really seem to change, even from some of the very earliest versions, is the idea of the final debate and the arguments put forth therein. So that's kind of neat because it means that insofar as the oath and subsequent curse of Feanor are concerned, we can rely pretty safely on the published Silmarillion account as being not only our best guess at what would have been Tolkien's final version or what's the version that contradicts the rest of the Legendarium the least, but also an element that was pretty much always present and pretty nearly in this form, which if you've been here a while or if you've read a lot of Tolkien's unpublished writings, you will know that is very rarely the case. Accordingly, it seems fitting to give here a couple of passages from the Silmarillion just to get us the exact wording and refresh everyone on what the context of this whole situation is. So here's an account of the Oath from the chapter of the Flight of the Noldor. Feanor swore a terrible oath. His seven sons leapt straightway to his side and took the selfsame vow together, and red as blood shone their drawn swords in the glare of the torches. They swore an oath, which none shall break, and none should take, by the name even of Iluvatar, calling the everlasting darkness upon them if they kept it not, and Manwe they named in witness, and Varda, and the hallowed mountain of Teniquitil, vowing to pursue with vengeance and hatred to the ends of the world, Vala, demon, elf, or man as yet unborn, or any creature, great or small, good or evil, that time should bring forth unto the end of days, whoso should hold, or take, or keep a Silmaril from their possession. Thus spoke Mitros and Maglor, and Kelegorm, Kurufin, and Karanthir, Amrod and Amras, princes of the Noldor. And many quailed to hear the dread words, for so sworn, good or evil, an oath may not be broken, and it shall pursue Oathkeeper and Oathbreaker to the world's end. In the same chapter, a few pages later, we have the words of the Herald of the Valar, the prophecy of the North and doom of the Noldor. Much it foretold in dark words, which the Noldor understood not, until the woes indeed after befell them. But all heard the curse that was uttered upon those that would not stay nor seek the doom and pardon of the Valar. Tears unnumbered ye shall shed, and the Valar will fence Valinor against you and shut you out, so that not even the echo of your lamentation shall pass over the mountains. On the house of Feanor the wrath of the Valar lieth from the west unto the uttermost east, and upon all that will follow them it shall be laid also. Their oath shall drive them and yet betray them, and ever snatch away the very treasures that they have sworn to pursue. To evil end shall all things turn, that they begin well, and by treason of kin unto kin, and the fear of treason, shall this come to pass. The dispossessed shall they be forever. Tragedy ensues, and several chapters later, in Of the Voyage of Arendil, we get the culmination and, in a weird way, the fulfillment of this oath. After the host of the Valar have taken possession of the two remaining Silmarils, Morgoth has been defeated, and the third Silmaril, the one recovered by Luthien and Baron, is already traversing the heavens attached to Eärendil, who is a dude and also a star. 
Then Aonwe, as Herald of the Elder King, summoned the elves of Beleriand to depart from Middle-earth, but Mithros and Maglor would not hearken, and they prepared, though now with weariness and loathing, to attempt, in despair, the fulfillment of their oath, for they would have given battle for the Silmarils were they withheld even against the victorious host of Valinor, even though they stood alone against all the world. And they sent a message, therefore, to Aonwe, bidding him yield up now those jewels which of old Feanor their father made, and Morgoth stole from him. But Anway answered that the right to the work of their father, which the sons of Feanor formerly possessed, had now perished, because of their many and merciless deeds, being blinded by their oath, and most of all because of their slaying of Dior and the assault upon the Havens. The light of the Silmaril should go now into the west, whence it came in the beginning, and to Valinor must Mithras and Magla return, and there abide the judgment of the Valar, by whose decree alone would Anwe yield the jewels from his charge. Then Maglor desired indeed to submit, for his heart was sorrowful, and he said, The oath says not that we may not bide our time, and it may be that in Valinor all shall be forgiven and forgot, and we shall come into our own in peace. But Mithros answered that if they returned to Amon, but the favor of the Valar were withheld from them, then their oath would still remain, but its fulfillment be beyond all hope. And he said, Who can tell to what dreadful doom we shall come if we disobey the powers in their own land, or propose ever to bring war again into their holy realm? Yet Maglor still held back, saying, If Manwe and Varda themselves deny the fulfillment of an oath to which we named them in witness, is it not made void? And Mithras answered, But how shall our voices reach to Iluvatar beyond the circles of the world? And by Iluvatar we swore in our madness, and called the everlasting darkness upon us if we kept not our word. Who shall release us? If none can release us, said Maglor, then indeed the everlasting darkness shall be our lot, whether we keep our oath or break it, but less evil shall we do in the breaking. Yet he yielded at last to the will of Mithros, and they took counsel together how they should lay hands on the Silmarils. And they disguised themselves and came in the night to the camp of Anway, and crept into the place where the Silmarils were guarded, and they slew the guards and laid hands on the jewels. Then all the camp was raised against them, and they prepared to die, defending themselves until the last. But Anwe would not permit the slaying of the sons of Feanor, and departing unfought, they fled far away. Each of them took to himself a Silmaril, for they said, Since one is lost to us and but two remain, and we two alone of our brothers, so it is plain that fate would have a share the heirlooms of our father. But the jewel burned the hand of Mithras in pain unbearable, and he perceived that it was as Aonwe had said and that his right thereto had become void, and that the oath was vain. And being in anguish and despair, he cast himself into a gaping chasm filled with fire, and so ended. And the Silmaril that he bore was taken into the bosom of the earth. And it is told of Maglor that he could not endure the pain with which the Silmaril tormented him. And he cast it at last into the sea, and thereafter he wandered ever upon the shores, singing in pain and regret beside the waves. Moment of silence there for Elrond's studies. Now on to the analysis. So, first of all, it can be assumed from this conversation specifically that the oath works. We're told when it's taken that none should break it, and then it's referenced a lot as if it does have some sort of actual effect. We hear about the oath awakening, we hear about the oath being at work, driving people to their deeds. But honestly, for like 80% of the first age, at least in my estimation, you could just as easily argue that the oath is sort of a shorthand for the known character and motives and history of the sons of Feanor. The very fact that they were willing to swear such an oath, coupled with what they did immediately thereafter, means that from a practical perspective, it's hard to distinguish an actual supernatural force at play from just the hubris and ambition and misplaced dedication of the Feanorians. But having removed the more wrathful, warlike, prideful siblings from the picture at this point, we're left with an exhausted Maglor and Mithros. They both really, really don't want to have to do this anymore. And moreover, they don't really have the resources or wherewithal to successfully pursue this goal, at least not in a way that aligns with their self-interest. They've pretty much resigned themselves to die one way or another. And that, coupled with the context of other cases of oaths and curses coming home, what we've seen, what we've been told, and the assumptions about speech and intent and free will, but also the irrevocable effects of said free will, especially as concerns elves, we assume that the oath does in fact 
exert some sort of inexorable force. And in the final chapters, for the first time, it's really treated as such, and not so much as a veiled threat or an excuse or an explanation or a scapegoat. And that's pretty interesting here, because if we assume that the oath has some sort of independent effect that's not just psychological or a matter of pride or ego, and we also assume that it is indeed unbreakable, at least by any power within Arda itself, it's very interesting that so much is made of this point of decision, and this argument even that assumes the oath is real and is working, but is also concerned with the question of, well, what is it that we should do now? What that tells us is that whatever the oath is doing, it's not literally controlling their actions and decisions. I've seen a lot of times in other fantasy settings the idea of a spell or a command or a vow being placed on another character um, of secrecy, for example, and they literally cannot say anything that would reveal any aspect of the secret. Like in the Aporson trilogy, there's characters that like their tongues will stop working if they get too close to revealing some sort of oath-bound hidden truth or memory lapses around whatever it is like that they're not supposed to be revealing. These characters literally have no will in the matter. They are actually being prevented from doing the thing that they swore not to do, or literally being forced into doing the thing that they swore to do. Now, while we hear about the oath of Feanor driving his sons, most particularly at this point, again, Mithras and Maglor, who really don't want to go along with it or see it fulfilled at this point, they would just as soon be done with it. But again, this conversation indicates that they're still the ones presumably in control of their decisions and actions. What they're not necessarily in control of is the results of said actions. So how then is it working? To my mind, there's two other explanations. And I've evaluated both of these options in more depth in the Oaths and Curses video. But just to kind of sum up here very quickly, um, option A is that the Oath of Feanor specifically, kind of uniquely among oaths and vows considered within Middle-earth, uh, does follow the traditional formula of naming and enforcing deity, naming witnesses, and naming a penalty in addition to simply specifying what it is that the oath taker is in fact promising to do. And here the threat is the everlasting darkness. And there are some problems with considering that as the penalty that's so fearsome that it's keeping the boys from giving up. So number one, according to orthodox elven theology, at least, there's this idea that elven souls can't be unmade. Finrod references this in his conversation with Andreth. So if the everlasting darkness is something like oblivion or nothingness or being cast out of being, A, supposedly that's impossible. B, supposing it were possible, it's not all that different from what elves believe may be awaiting them at the end of the world anyway, which is basically that they will continue to exist bodiless and be unable to participate in any kind of world or tangible creation, which is a condition they instinctively seem to recoil from and find abhorrent. And C, the Valar, for instance, don't seem terribly convinced that even if you swear an oath in the name of Eru to pursue people with wrath and vengeance, that it's possible to change the nature of your being in this way. Mondos makes reference to Feanor's soul coming to him soon, so that would at least imply that, that having taken this oath, even if they die before they fulfill it, it's not like they will instantaneously be dissolved. The prediction seems to be that Feanor and his fellow oath-takers, upon death, will revert to the Halls of Mondos. Granted, Feanor, at least, died very definitely in direct, active pursuit of said oath, so that's an important caveat to keep in mind for later. There's another thing that the Valar, or at the very least one of their ambassadors or mouthpieces, says regarding the oath, and that would be the Doom of the Noldor. 
which doesn't say anything specifically about any kind of everlasting darkness or banishment into the void, but does describe such things as innumerable tears, the wrath of the Valar themselves, which I could interpret to mean the very forces of nature being pitted against you, anything good that you try to do will eventually turn into evil, and everything you try to do in the name of the oath will eventually backfire on you, and perpetually you will be dispossessed. Now, to me, this sounds way more haunting and terrifying than just the idea of everlasting darkness or oblivion or the void. I mean, nothingness is pretty creepy, presumably even more creepy to elves who are very attached to the material world in a way that supposedly mortals are not. But if given the choice between an eternity of nothingness and an eternity of futility, disappointment, grief, self-loathing, and being powerless to stop yourself from turning into the villain you don't want to become and being trapped that way until the end of the world, like, I know which one sounds worse to me. So my conclusion was that, in the moment, Feanor's basically offering to be completely unmade. Um, He's choosing the closest thing his imagination can conceive of to hell as his penalty. What neither he nor his sons can fathom, yet, is that there's so much worse that can happen to them. And I feel like the real everlasting darkness is what the Valar describe as the natural consequences of the oath in their prophecy. Basically, the oath becomes the curse, the curse is the oath, they are one and the same, and the effects of them are to rip the oath-takers away from everything and everyone that they've ever loved, and to alienate them from themselves, and to become even unto themselves objects of hatred and loathing, and not be able to escape that, no matter what you do or don't do. And that, I think, finds at least a little bit of textual support. It's at least a valid interpretation. Hold on to your baseball hats, because we are about to get decidedly invalid. So here's Maglor and Mithros, quite prepared to accept death as a consequence of whatever they do. So it's not a question of a fear of death. And Maglor makes three distinct arguments, which again are basically taking the same form from the earliest versions to the latest. Argument one is that if the brothers just go along with the instructions they've been given to submit, to return to Valinor, and to await the judgment of the Valar, the Valar might eventually have mercy on them and decide to give them back the Silmarils, and there's nothing wrong with pursuing the oath sort of indirectly, pursuing the oath, for instance, by waiting rather than by taking immediate direct action. We will get back to this. Argument two is that if they swore naming Manwe and Varda as witnesses, and Manwe and Varda are the forces preventing them from immediate fulfillment of the oath, then shouldn't that cancel it out? Short answer, no. We'll come back to this. Argument three, no matter what we do, It's going to be a bad time, so we might as well just break the oath. Interesting that Maglor is here proposing to break an oath that is explicitly stated to be unbreakable. So we'll start with argument number two because it's the most readily dismissed. Maglor's like, if Manwe and Varda, whom we named as witnesses, themselves are the forces denying the fulfillment of the oath, Isn't that one of the only things that could cancel out this oath? Mithros, of course, retorts that the oath was sworn in the name of Eru Iluvatar, who is beyond the circles of Arda. Basically, they're not in a position to go ask him for help. Elvish theology is not one that supposes the possibility of a personal relationship with the divine basically having willfully made the decision to cast themselves as villains. They can't conceive of why or how a force that's supposedly one of pure goodness would have any sympathy for them. They even seem to doubt that they'd be able to get Eru's attention. Why should he intervene in the case of two ultimately insignificant individuals who don't deserve it? So they're unable to depend upon 
the will of the Valar to convincingly oppose the oath, which leaves them with apparently two other options. And I'm going to argue that those two options are actually just sort of versions of a single option. And they are waiting things out or breaking the oath. Now, Maglor argues that there is a distinction between waiting to see if the oath might be fulfilled in a particular way, no matter how long that might take, and simply deciding to not pursue the oath any longer. There's a couple of problems with that. Um, First of all, if we're going to use the legalist paradigm, the oath specifies that you have to pursue with wrath and vengeance whoever should withhold a Silmaril. Eonwe, at least, has for the time being, certainly withheld a Silmaril, so he's already on the chopping block. It's hard to see how even Manwe and Varda would escape falling under this clause, even if they ceded to the Feanorian claim as quickly as they could. Certainly, they would have the Silmarils in their possession, which seems to fall under the taking or finding or keeping clauses, even if just for a split second. And interestingly, so far the supposition has been if you just give them back the Silmaril, then they'll leave you alone. But that's not really what the oath says. The oath says you've got to pursue everyone who even just picks it up for a second. So even if we accept this very literal, legalistic interpretation of the oath, which I argue is not really how oaths work, it's more about the intent behind them, Uh, but even accepting this paradigm from which Maglor seems to be making these arguments, no, the oath does not impose any kind of time limit, except, of course, you know, for the ending of the world. But what you swore to do was not regain the Silmarils by any means necessary up to and including years of peaceful submissive servitude. What the oath specified was pursuit with wrath and vengeance. It's not about getting the Silmarils back, it's about exacting violence against anyone who would dare to question your claim. So that doesn't seem like it's going to work. Now, Mithras frames it as an if statement. If the Valar don't cooperate, then we'll be in the even worse position of committing violence in the very blessed realm itself, which he suggests is not going to end particularly well for them. And he is probably right about that. It's hard for me to conceive of the Valar just giving in and giving the Feanorians back their Silmarils. Um, Even if they do, they only have the two. One of them has been attached to Eärendil, who is sailing the heavens as a star. And, like, could the Valar undo that at this point? I really don't know. Which means that the best-case scenario here would be the Feanorians in Valinor with a Silmaril apiece obliged to contemplate the possibility of an assault on heaven itself. And it's notable that presumably this state of affairs would hold true even if Anwe had surrendered the Silmarils immediately. The big difference here that I can see is that in one version, they would be in Valinor and therefore have the potential to do way more damage than would be the case if they remain on the shores of Middle-earth, where there is no potential access to the heavens whereas in Valinor there very much is. Again, we'll come back to the question of collateral damage. But my point here is that trying to apply legalism to oaths just generally does not tend to work well in Middle-earth, and specifically here, where we have the words of the oath, Magler's right in that, again, there is no time frame, but he's wrong in assuming that the oath, at least as written here, was ever about getting the Silmarils at all. The boys didn't swear just to get them back, they swore to pursue with wrath and vengeance. Now, by extension, then, there is no solution to the oath that can rely on a technicality of wording, or what I've been referring to in my head as the oath-by-proxy approach, and that is borne out by the narrative, because the Feanorians have tried that approach for the past 500 years, and the results have not been great. The first example of this is if we view the siege of Angband itself as an indirect attempt to fulfill the oath. Direct assault having proven not terribly effective, to say nothing of efficient, upon Mithras' return from Angband, the assumption seems to be, well, we need to oppose Morgoth, but he's a lot stronger than we thought he was, 
So we need to be smart about it. As long as we're keeping wrath and vengeance forefront in our minds, we can take our sweet time. And thus the Noldor besiege the north, the Feanorians play nice temporarily with all of their many cousins and uncles and so forth, and for a few centuries they just simply deflect any attempts that Morgoth makes to break the siege. And then they get complacent. The northernmost parties tend to be of the opinion that the longer we wait, the stronger Morgoth is getting, which indeed proves to be the case, and we've been holding the siege long enough, it's time to start taking thought for a direct assault. Except, especially to those leaders who are located more to the south and to the east, that all sounds like a lot of work and unnecessary bloodshed and suffering, and they're having a pretty good time throwing their respective weight around Beleriand. So they're in no hurry to risk that for the sake of defeating Morgoth and reclaiming the Silmarils, even though some of them have sworn a pretty stringent oath to that effect. So eventually, of course, the siege is broken, ruin falls upon much of the north, and it's proven pretty conclusively that the bide your time and pursue the Silmarils indirectly approach is not really an effective one, at least as far as destiny is concerned. The Feanorians lose the greater part of their holdings, you know, there's that term, the dispossessed, cropping up again. And the minute that pursuit with wrath and vengeance takes a back seat to, but my kingdom is really prosperous right now, and look at all this power I'm able to consolidate, that's when things go horribly wrong. Now, arguably, the breaking of the siege was inevitable anyway, and it's just a coincidence that it happened to come after the moment where the Noldor decide to prioritize other things. Except as a direct result of the breaking of the Siege of Angband and the Fourth Battle, we then get the Nargothrond incident, which I think more than anything shows the consequences of taking the oath by proxy approach. So this one is kind of a fun one to examine, because while Maglor and Mithros at the end of the First Age are reluctant to do anything overtly evil, Kelligorm and Kruifin, midway through, are, like, only too happy to just indulge their most dastardly sides. And it's kind of fantastic. In no way an endorsement of their actions, but I just, I, I can't help but admire the brio with which they commit to just being absolute self-interested jerks. It's beautiful to watch. So poor little Baron, oath-bound to his suicide mission to make an attempt at least to retrieve a Silmaril to prove his love, shows up in Nargothrond invoking another oath to acquire Finrod's support, and Kelligorm and Kruifin respond by invoking their own oath, and hijinks occur. But here's what's interesting. Even though Kelligorm and Kruifin mention their oath and point out that should Baron succeed, they will be compelled to visit all kinds of horrible violence upon him and anyone who helped him. They're not actually interested in taking any steps to fulfill the oath themselves. I mean, technically, either they should be the ones out there trying to sneak into Angband, or they should be directly declaring their enmity towards Baron and, by extension, Finrod. But they don't do either of those things because it's not in their best interests to do so. Their goals are to become the most powerful lords in the region. Their justification is that with more power and influence, they will be more easily able to mount an assault against Sangbad and eventually defeat Morgoth and reclaim all three Silmarils. But even though it's evil, this is just another version of Maglor's proposal that the oath will be satisfied if you pursue the Silmarils through indirect avenues. Again, legalism rarely works, and even if we admit legalism as a potential lens through which to view this problem, the oath says nothing about efforts to regain the Silmarils efficiently or effectively. It specifies instead the manner in which they must be pursued, i.e., and I hate to sound like a broken record here, with wrath and vengeance. Now, Kelligorm and Kruifin are pretty well satisfied that if they just do nothing, Baron and Finrod will meet a sticky end, and they are pretty well justified in that belief. 
but that's not enough. And, and I feel like this can easily get overlooked because Kelegorm and Kurufin in Nargothrond act in their own self-interests. By overthrowing Finrod's rule and turning his own people against him, they've taken an arguably purely evil action. But the oath isn't concerned with good or evil, or with probability of success. It wants commitment. So Kelegorm and Kurufin are arguably the first brothers to break the oath. You know, that oath that supposedly cannot be broken. And by consciously pursuing an indirect avenue when a direct one presented itself, they awaken the power of said unbreakable oath, which takes action to ensure that it will be fulfilled by manipulating the element of chance. Because what happens shortly after Finrod and Baron get kicked out of Nargothrond to meet their death in some convenient way elsewhere? Well, by chance, the brothers happen to come upon Luthien, and this encounter gets them even deeper involved in the question of the outcome of the quest. Having come across Luthien, what is it that they do? Do they see in her a potential instrument by which to achieve their quest, and so offer their aid to her at least until the point that the Silmaril is regained? No. Do they slay her for daring to support the claim to a Silmaril of someone who is not a Feanorian? No. So what is their plan? Well, according to the Silmarillion, believing that Baron and Feligund were prisoners beyond hope of aid, they proposed to let the king perish and to keep Luthien and force Thingol to give her hand to Kelegorm. Thus, they would advance their power and become the mightiest of the princes of the Noldor, and they did not propose to seek the Silmarils by craft or war, or to suffer any others to do so, until they had all the might of the elf kingdoms under their hands. Gee, boys, it still really seems like you're prioritizing your own ego and ambition over your binding and unholy vow. So then what happens? Well, we already know what's going to happen because the Doom of Mondos tells us. Their hopes are going to be dashed by treachery. In this case, the treachery of Huan the dog. Justified treachery? Absolutely. Huan is the bestest of boys. But a breaking of faith nonetheless. Huan helps Luthien escape Nargothrond. Together, they overthrow Sauron and kick him out of Tolingarhoth. The captives that Luthien frees spread news of what's been happening, and this results in the brothers getting thrown out of Nargothrond. In addition to just generally being dastardly, Kelegorm and Kurufin now just start being dumb, because you would think at this point maybe they'd be triggered by all of these unfortunate coincidences to suspect that maybe some sort of doom was afoot and maybe they needed to pay a little bit more attention to random mortal dude and Thingol's runaway daughter. But no, they try to wash their hands of the business and head back up north to try and glean some sympathy from Mithros. And in what has to be the most obvious instance of Ambar intruding and shaping the course of the narrative yet, who should they just so happen to run into but Baron and Luthien? And this time they finally do decide to go with the pursue with wrath and vengeance option, though I doubt that they're thinking of it in those terms and they're probably just very ticked off. We get further treachery in the form of Huan finally and permanently forsaking his association with Kelgorm and actually turning on him. And Baron acquires from Kurufin the knife Angris that he's going to be able to use later to cut the single Silmaril out of Morgoth's crown. Though, interestingly enough, this is the knife that breaks when he goes to get the second one. There's some rather doomalicious implications there as well, but we'll have to get into those another time. Plainly, it is because of their oath that Kelegorm and Kurufin end up in bitter enmity with Baron and Luthien. But it's equally clear that it was not their conscious, willful attempts to fulfill said oath that brought about this state of affairs. They're trying again and again to delay and to defer the need to directly pursue the oath, because in their minds, given the current situation, to do so would be suicide, and also very disadvantageous politically. But the oath doesn't care. The second the fates of Baron and Luthien intersect with the fates of the Silmaril, the oath starts manipulating dooms and chances to just continually throw the two of them into the path of the Sons of Feanor. It won't let them just walk away or pursue other goals, even though they are trying to. The curse is the oath, the oath is the curse, and it's literally unbreakable regardless of the decisions made. 
Now, actually, arguably, apart from the kinslayings, the closest the Sons of Feanor actually come to trying to actively and directly fulfill their oath, at least after the death of Feanor and that first sort of headlong charge, is the Nirnaith Arnoidiad, which Mithros decides to embark upon after the whole Baron and Luthien thing goes down. Now, in the Silmarillion, it says that he lifted up his heart, perceiving that Morgoth was not unassailable uh, based on Baron and Luthien's success. So the suggestion there is that he's actually more hopeful now, or he sees that it's a possibility. I think you could think of a few other potential reasons for that than just a renewed sense of hope. For instance, something that happens immediately before Mithros gets really involved in planning for his great alliance is that the brothers are placed in the horribly awkward position of having to remind Thingol that technically that Silmaril, brought to him by his now mortal daughter and her scruffy fiancé, does legally belong to the family who attempted to abduct and forcibly marry said daughter. Thingol responds, telling them to basically get bent, um, which can't have been a surprise, and the uh, two brothers most nearly involved with the issue immediately respond with threats of war. It doesn't take a genius to see that open conflict with Doriath over the Silmaril is on the horizon. Again, for the past 400 or so years, the Oath has slept. Now there's two people withholding Silmarils from the Feanorians, Thingol and Morgoth, so the only possible way you can justify not attacking Thingol is if you are actively taking steps to move against Morgoth directly. Does this occur to Mithros? I don't know. But I would imagine that, hypothetically, he would be pretty well acquainted with the state of Beleriand politics, his siblings' tendencies, and at least a little bit with the inner machinations of doom and cursedness, even at this point. Sadly for him, his knowledge is not yet fully ripened because the Nirnaith ends in tragedy and disaster, due once more to treachery and fear of treachery. The tears unnumbered part of the prophecy is amply fulfilled. There ends up being no way to avoid conflict with Doriath, and even though technically they are victorious militarily, three of the sons end up dying in the attempt, including the two that kind of started this whole chapter of the saga. And apparent in these two tragedies is the principle that any attempt to fulfill the oath and retake the Silmarils, whether it proceed from apparently good motives or apparently evil ones, will just result in the Feanorians being even farther away from their goal and even less able to attain it, to the point where by the third kinslaying, people are turning into birds and carrying the Silmaril off to become a star in the heavens. It's like each attempt moves it exponentially farther beyond their grasp. So let us return at last to a consideration of that final debate. So the Valar are powerless against the oath, not only because it was sworn in the name of Eru, but because it represents the freely willed action of some of Eru's children with whom they are forbidden to meddle. So it's not just neutralized because the Valar, whom the Feanorians named as witnesses, are telling them that they are not permitted to fulfill this oath. Likewise, we've seen many different versions of let's just bide our time turn out to be non-starters. In fact, there really doesn't seem to be that much difference between the decision to outright break the oath or refuse to pursue the Silmarils in any capacity versus the decision to pursue them indirectly by, for example, waiting for the Valar to have mercy on us or ignoring the scruffy human who says he's going to get our Silmaril and our cousin who is sworn to help him because it's much more convenient to simply depose said cousin and enjoy his kingdom. It boils down to the same thing. The oath is going to intervene to manipulate destiny itself until whatever you do, no matter what it is you're trying to do, is going to end up re-involving you somehow with the Silmarils. So what's the best move in this situation? Well, keeping in mind the futility clause, if you want Morgoth to be defeated, you can't be the one to defeat him. You can't just walk away from the problem and attempt to start a new life, because doing that is just going to throw you all the more surely into the path of whoever now possesses the Silmarils. But since you're never going to succeed in acquiring them, 
The alternative is just a progressively escalating cycle of cruelty and violence. And you definitely do not want to take that bad energy with you back into Valinor, which is the last remaining haven of relative peace and security in the whole world, the place where most of your remaining living kin live, and the place where presumably any of your deceased kin would hope to dwell upon reincarnation. Honestly, the best outcome at this point, the one that minimizes both suffering to you and to others, is to undertake the suicide mission of trying to reclaim the Silmarils and dying in the attempt. Once dead, you'll either be dissolved into oblivion if the everlasting darkness is sort of a more literal threat, or if it's not a literal penalty but more of a self-imposed condition of the oath being sworn to begin with, you'll end up in Mondos, held presumably until the end of Arda, and rendered safely unable to continue to pursue this goal. There's a bonus if you actually do somehow manage to get hold of the Silmarils before your demise, because then technically you can argue you fulfilled the oath. I'm not saying at all that canonically this could have been Mithras' thought process. But as far as I can see, if it had been, his plan would have been essentially unchanged. But ironically, even the quest for death is twisted at the last second because Aonwe orders the Feanorians to be spared, and they find that the Silmarils burn their hands, and they perceive that through their own actions, they have voided their own claim to the jewels that are now rejecting them as creatures of evil. Apparently this torment is so great that it's what drives Mithros to cast himself into a chasm and Maglor to hurl his Silmaril into the ocean. Which seems like it has to be true more poetically than literally. I mean, you could maybe argue that putting the Silmaril down even for a second, even if it's still clearly within your possession, would constitute breaking the oath and would therefore be verboten. But I mean, as people have pointed out, you could probably construct some sort of a pouch you could carry it around in little pincers until you could build it a little chest or maybe set it in a necklace. Like, if it's just a question of now this thing is too hot for me to touch, oh woe is me, there would seem to be ways to get around that. So I think what would really cause more anguish and torment is not the burning of the Silmaril itself, but what that means. Through his deeds, Mithros has himself denied his own claim to the jewel. Maglor likewise. This oath is unfulfillable, and ironically, even if you try to fulfill it in a way that seems to guarantee your death, it'll bite you in the butt, and you'll survive. If you seek victory, you'll get defeat, but even seeking defeat and death will be turned on you, and what you'll get instead is survival, but survival with no hope. That knowledge is the kind of torment that I think even the most steadfast would find unendurable. Now, I did warn you all at the beginning that this was more or less going to boil down to an elaborate headcanon, albeit, I would say, a pretty well-sourced one. But if you've stuck with me this long, I will reward your patience here by extending this theory out to tie into some thematic concerns. So at the very beginning, I made sure to distinguish between the possibility of Mithros' choice and argument being the logically correct one and it being the moral one, or the option that they, quote, should have taken. The argument really boils down to what should we do about the Silmarils, knowing that we will probably never be able to get them, but that it seems that we can't exactly walk away. And there's sort of a similar paradoxical problem that kicks off the Lord of the Rings concerning what to do with the ring. We can't use it, we can't keep it, we can't hide it, the best thing would be to destroy it, but there doesn't seem to be any practical way to achieve that. And so, even though Frodo's errand seems hopeless from the get-go, it's in fact their only hope, because essentially what the Fellowship and the Free Peoples generally are doing is undertaking the only non-evil course of action in the hopes that some external fate will intervene, and in some way that they can't yet figure out, the results of this seemingly doomed decision will turn out to be somehow good or redeemable. It comes back to that idea of Estel. It's an act of hope and trust that flies in the face of logic. And of course, this turns out to be the right decision. And this quality of Estel is notably lacking in either of the brothers' arguments, but particularly in Mithros's. He doesn't seem to see 
any way how this can possibly end well, full stop. Maglor's proposal that they should repent, submit to the Valar, throw themselves at their mercy, and hope that somehow a way will be found to controvert the doom that their own decisions have placed upon them, doesn't seem like it should work. All the evidence is against it, but it's exactly the kind of demonstration of faith and trust and a dependence on pity that is characteristic of, indeed, the only kinds of solutions that tend to work to resolve knotty problems within the context of Arda. All of Mithras's cold logic is not, in the end, of any avail to him, but it's possible that humility and surrender might have been. That's because it's, of course, one of Tolkien's recurring themes that no matter your courage or commitment or willingness to sacrifice or how impeccable your chain of reasoning is, if you don't have that radical trust that somehow things will turn out for the best, you won't be able to transcend destiny, and you'll remain bound by the pattern of decisions that you and others have already made. 